here on Friday. Remember, we are not having class. It's the day of our field trip. And I passed out to everybody what you need to do for the field trip. What you need to do can easily be done in an hour and a half. Right, so you don't have to spend the whole day there. Um, if you look there, and I saved one for me, I put just some sessions here. And so you can choose any talks that you're interested in within those sessions. You have to only have two of the four talks that you report on are within those sessions. So that means, let's say that you really are interested in biological medical research, right? You can have two of your talks that you write about being ones from other sessions about you know, biological medical research, but two of them have to be from those sessions. And then you have to report on two poster sessions. <laughs> um, so the poster sessions are, there should be people there to explain the posters at the two times that I have written here. And so in Olin 249, around 19 and around 1030, you should have a break in the sessions. Now don't just walk in the middle of somebody talking. Wait, wait until the presentation's done, then come in. And it's only about 15 or 20 minutes. You need to, you know, not just uh, sit back for 15 minutes and say, okay, let me get this done now, because you won't have time. For the reports, you can see the reports are pretty slim. All you need to do is put the name of the session you're at and the location, and then the title of the talk and the actual person presenting. Now when you check in, they're gonna give you a printed version of the document that I put a link to on the front, where are the front pages, and it will say who's supposed to be presenting. And at least 70% of the time, that's who actually presents. But you know, make sure that you actually have the name of the person presented and you have the time that they actually started, because depending on the person that's the that's in charge of the session, some people are militant. That's the way I, well, actually in my session there was only one talk last year, there's zero talks this year, so I don't have to be all that militant. But I want to be on schedule, right? Other people will be like, ah, oh, let's just get it all in. So make sure you actually pay attention and write down the time it starts and the time it ends. Another thing, make sure you're actually present. Last year I had a student who turned in a report on a session I was at and he was not at. <laughs> uh, make sure you're honest about things, right? That's just not the way to do it. Um, then you have under those things, notes you take during the talk. So just your notes, right? It's not something significant like you have to take everything that they said. Just your notes, topics that were interesting to you, things that, that you thought, oh, I wonder why. And then the question, that's a question that you would have liked to have asked. You don't have to raise your hand and ask your question. Because oftentimes you just don't feel comfortable there raising your hand and asking a question. But write down a question that you were curious about the talk with. And so that's how you report on the talk. It's pretty simple and brief. For the posters, it's a little bit different because in the posters, there's no time frame. The person doesn't stand up there and talk for a while. You come, you read the poster, and you ask them questions. And so in the poster session, you really do ask questions. And one thing you'll observe is there's a lot of variation in quality of posters. It, it would be ideal if we could turn in our posters after this conference because then you see, oh, I saw this in these posters and it was really cool. I saw this and that was a real mistake. But for the posters, make sure you write down who you're talking to because the poster may have three different poster people and you're only talking to one of them. Make sure you get the right one. And um, actually ask them a question and write down your question and their answer. Now, one more thing, well, two more things. How to dress. You'll find people who are dressed the whole game, just like you find in the classroom. We would like our Union College students to be on the professional side because this is a professional conference. It's a professional conference for collegiate audiences. We have college students, uh, one, guy, one guy here, Gunnar, he pronounced his name Gunnar, which Scandinavian and she kind of sexy. I'm not sure his life passes that way. Yeah, he came to talk as a freshman, which was really impressive to me. Um, but you have college students like you giving their talks on their research projects. And I want you to try to represent you in college professional manner. So make sure you're dressed up. I say kind of like I am, okay? Not like you're actually I do wear this in church, but not, <laughs> not dressed to the nines. 
but not you know <laughs> wearing shorts or you know holy jeans. You know, you want to look somewhat professional. You will find people who are wearing shorts and holy jeans. I just am hoping that they're not our students. Um, there are some common courtesy things about, you know, make sure your phone doesn't ring during a talk. Don't be making noise during somebody's presentation. Don't be walking up to the front there in the middle of the talk to find that one open seat. Right, don't be disruptive. So the time you go is up to you. The back page has a guest parking permit. And unlike previous years, this year you can park anywhere on the entire campus without worry of a ticket, unless it says no parking zone any parking area on campus. So you just take this, I made it so it's a spare sheet, you can just rip it off, put it in the dashboard of your car and park where you like. Um, if you don't have a ride, contact, of course, contact classmates, contact me. I will be going and coming a few times because I'm gonna have to come back in the middle and then go back for more. Um, you know, so we can, we wanna range rides as we can, but. The school is not providing rides this year. Any questions? Yes. So the two required portions are, you're just talking about sessions, not posters, right? Well, you have to have two posters. Right. And you have to have, yeah, posters of your choice. Okay. And then two talks of your choice, and then two talks that are from those sessions I listed. <laughs> you, you might enjoy the teaching ones just because it's what we as teachers face. Um, the, there's only like two talks, and one of them's, you know, talking to a silent audience or something like that. It's, yeah, tells of our frustrations. So any questions about how this works? If you want to see and plan ahead, which is the best way to do it, just follow that link. It gives you the entire list of talks. You can see which talks you find interesting. Yes, Gila. Is this on Moodle? Yes, it's also on Moodle. Yes. If you have class at nine so to like, one? I have the like nine to ten. Uh-huh. Like and I can't get to the eight or ten o'clock. Oh, okay. So you're talking about the poster sessions. Yeah. But yeah. But if if you can't no, if you can't make it the other sessions. The like is the one required well, to are they only ten minutes long or could be the, the talks are, are depending on which session, ten to twenty minutes long. <laughs> the talks are ten to twenty minutes long and you only have to report on two talks from within those sessions and you see there are sessions that cover the entire morning and sessions that cover the entire afternoon. So you're going to be able to get the requisite to no matter what time of day you show up. Does that 10 a.m. one just mean that it starts at 10? And yes, other it starts at 10 and runs until, actually, I think the 10 a.m. one starts at 10, breaks for lunch, and then keeps going after lunch. So it's like all morning long that yes. it's going? So we yes. can come to so, any part of that? Right, right. So if, if you look in the, on that link document, it will show this talk at this time, this talk at this time. Those talk times, like I said, they might stick to them exactly or they might not. But I would sit down tonight and say, oh, this one looks like something really interesting that I could understand. And this one looks super boring that I'm definitely not going to go listen to. Right? So you actually have a plan and you can go and optimize your time. That's the way good scientists go to conferences. Slacker scientists go to conferences and say, huh. I wonder what I can do at the beach during the, you know, that's, yeah, the bad way to do it. Any other questions? All right, let's try to get some physics in before we do the old teacher evaluation. Hooray, I've got all the technology working again, people. <laughs> Yesterday I couldn't scroll. It was a problem. Okay, so we're going to look at some radiometric and dating and nuclear power situations. You've already seen a slide that looks very similar to this, but not this. This is more information dense. First, there's an equation on here that you haven't seen. The equation for the size of the nucleus of an atom. I have skipped lots of homework questions because, you know, there's like a lot of them on this. And I keep like, I should have had this, I should have had this, but I hadn't covered it yet. You might have noticed there's no homework due tonight. How do people notice that? Yeah, pretty good group. Because I figure we didn't have anything that would be considered new material, really, from our lecture on Monday that I give homework on. So the radius of a nucleus is 1.2 fm. What does fm stand for? Femtometer or Fermi. 1.2 Fermi's times A. What is A? 
A stands for atomic, but you need more than that. Okay, so the atomic mass is the number of nucleons. So that's adding up the number of protons plus the number of neutrons raised to the one-third power. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from two different things that work together. Number one is it comes from experimental measurements going all the way back to um, Rutherford. Rutherford made measurements on the size of the nucleus from his, you know, extrapolation or extensions of the thin gold, thin film gold, okay, thin gold film experiment. And then from the idea that the nucleus is essentially a bunch of spheres that are packed tightly together. So if you take a bunch of marbles and you pack them together, the volume is you know, pi r, four thirds pi r cubed. And so when you pack them all together, they said that it should be that the volume and the radius are you know, proportional to radius cubed for the volume. And so that's how we get the relationship here, that the radius, the volume is proportional to the number of balls, and so the radius is proportional to the cube root of the number of balls. Those balls mean protons and neutrons. So we've got the atomic number, the neutron number, the total number of neutrons in the nucleus, the atomic mass, and here is how we indicate a nuclide. You have X, the chemical symbol, the chemical symbol tells us the element. What else tells us the element? The number of protons Z. So those two things tell us the same thing. Then we have A, which is the total number of nucleons, protons plus neutrons, and the neutron number, the number of neutrons. Obviously, you don't need both of the things in the circle there. If you have one of the things in the circle and one of the others, you know all of the values. So let's go to our... Alpha decay. Energy is released in alpha decay. We've learned from talking about uh, relativity that energy and mass are the same thing. Mass is a form of energy. And so when we have this decay, if we're giving kinetic energy to something, then we have to have lost some energy from something else, which comes from losing mass. So when you have an alpha decay, you're going to have a lower mass on the daughter side and a higher mass on the parent side. And you can calculate how much energy was released by just taking the difference. You take the mass of the parent side minus the mass of the daughter side, multiply by the speed of light squared, tells you how much energy was released. Okay, first of our clicker questions. Whoops, give me a sec. Okay, now you can answer. A hypothetical element is identified as Superscript 97, X subscript 56. How many protons does this element contain? Do you have your clicker, Megan? Okay. okay, so we had 0, 13, 5, 1, and 0. So let's get an explanation here from Brandy. Okay, perfect. We have... A is equal to Z plus N, and we're given N, so we have A is equal to 97 is given, N is equal to 56, so that means Z must equal A minus N, so subtract them, and we have 41. The masses of a proton and neutron are not exactly the same. They're very similar. We generally just count them. Right, like when we said the volume and the radius relate by the number of nucle nucleides, nuclides raised to one-third power. But here's the actual values for the mass of a proton, neutron, and electron in three different units. 
The first one, this is the SI unit. It's the one you're probably most comfortable seeing. But it's the one we use the least in nuclear physics because it requires more calculation. The second one here, the mass and atomic mass units, is basically one for a proton and one for a neutron. It makes it easy. You just count the protons and neutrons, and that gives you the mass and atomic mass units. And finally, the last one in is in energy per C squared. That's most useful because we're often trying to find the energy from the mass. So if I have the mass of a proton is 938.27 MeV per C squared, then what's the rest of energy going to be? Yeah, because energy is mc squared, I take that mass multiplied by c squared, and I just have the same 938.27 MeV. Now, the definition of atomic mass unit, I think, is lost on a lot of people. Most people know that the definition of the atomic mass unit is that a carbon-12 atom has a mass of exactly 12 atomic mass units. Well... And a mole of carbon-12 atoms has a mass of exactly 12 grams. If you take those two statements and put them together, what that means is the atomic mass unit is simply one gram divided by Avogadro's number. So the atomic mass unit is just de it's defined by Avogadro's number. One over Avogadro's number gives you the atomic mass unit in grams. And so this is... One atomic mass unit in grams, of course, it was kilograms would be times 10 to the minus 27, or in MeV per C squared. And then once again, we've already seen the equation about the energy released. I will give you some problems asking you to calculate things like, you know, how much energy is released when you have this kind of decay or something like that. For those problems, you're just going to use this relationship to energy released. Is mass of the parent, so you take all the parent things minus the mass of the daughter, all the daughter things, multiplied by c squared. And where do you get those masses? Our textbook has a table that I linked there. Or I gave another link that is much more complete. Our textbook does have an advantage in that the textbook tells you it decays via this type of decay, like via alpha decay, via beta decay. Whereas the National Institute of Standards and oh, – standards and what? I don't know. They don't tell you the type of decays. But that's where you can get the numbers for doing the homework problems. Okay, you've seen this graph already. Nuclear power. I talked about fission. What did we have to have to cause uranium-235 to undergo this fission? Okay, it had to absorb a neutron. And that graph on the left shows us that for it to absorb a neutron, the probability, the green line is uranium-235, the probability of uranium-235 absorbing a neutron is much, much higher if that neutron is going extremely slow. Much, much, much lower if it's going fast. So to have a likelihood that is reasonable of the neutron being absorbed, it has to be going slow. So we call a slow neutron a thermal neutron. Thermal because you could measure temperature to give you its speed. So that's the first step. You have to have a slow neutron to make it happen. Then you form an unstable uranium that breaks into two smaller pieces, and this was just one example. So you're going to have, you know, one piece like this and one piece like this, you know, so that you add up to the total mass you started with. And you release energy. If you release energy... That means that the mass here, is it higher, lower, or the same as the mass you started with? It has to have lower mass because you release the energy. Now, something that's important to note here, there are two elements shown that have a high probability of absorbing a thermal neutron. What are those two elements? Can you read it? Do I need to zoom in? What are the two elements? Plutonium-239 and uranium-235. Well, what's the most common isotope of uranium? Here's uranium-238's cross-section. 
it doesn't absorb anything that's slow. It only absorb things that are fast, but its probability is very low of absorbing a fast neutron. So that means uranium-238 is pretty much useless for making a bomb or a nuclear power plant. But if you hit it with fast-moving neutrons, you might get the uranium-238 to absorb a neutron, right? And if you make that uranium-238 absor absorb a neutron, it will undergo a reaction, a decay, to produce plutonium. Or not plutonium, first neptunium. Now, Neptunium has one more proton. It absorbed a neutron and it has one more proton. What obviously had to happen? It had to have something like a beta decay so that you create a proton. And then you absorb another neutron, and now there has to be something more complicated going on. You create the plutonium 239. Now, to create plutonium 239, that, you know, I said you absorb two neutrons, but you know, two neutrons would raise the atomic number by or the atomic mass by two, not just by one. So it's something that's a little more complicated still. But plutonium-239 is created by man by bombarding uranium-238 with neutrons. Plutonium-239, as you saw in the graph, is a useful item for nuclear energy because it has actually a really strong absorption if you have the right speed of neutrons. So if you want to make a nuclear power plant, you would ideally want to have one of those two, either uranium-235 or plutonium-239. What would you want to have if you were going to make a bomb? You'd want to have the same two, uranium-235 or plutonium-239. So the stuff that makes a good fuel for a bomb makes a good fuel for a nuclear power plant. Hence, when people are making weapons-grade plutonium or weapons grade uranium, they have got a bunch of one of those two. And if Iran says, we're doing it because we want to make nuclear power plants, that is a, a viable explanation. It may not be the truth, but it's viable because the material is useful for that. Now, nuclear reactors, I don't have any slides in nuclear reactors this year, but I'm gonna talk about them nonetheless. If I want to make a nuclear power plant, is that good or bad? Good. I think most of us agree that's a good thing. Nuclear power plants give off very minimal radiation. They have far less radioactive pollutants going into the atmosphere than a coal burning plant. So they're, they're good, clean power. You do have a downside. You have to take your spent fuel and put it somewhere. You dug it out of the ground. So it's not like, you know, you have this pollutant that didn't exist before. You depleted it, but now you've got to bury it again. And while we don't worry much about uranium rocks that naturally occur in the ground because it's not our fault, we worry a lot about burning, burning, burying uranium rocks that we have now enriched and used. And so that's the big drawback that people see in nuclear power plants. But I, I tend to see it as a good thing as long as we have a safe way of disposing of the radioactive waste so that we won't have you know, we're talking half-lives in the millions of years. We don't have somebody who digs up a rock. Hey, what's this? And gets heavy radiation. So how do they make a nuclear power plant? Well, first you have to have the fuel rods. So you have fuel rods. Rods of something like enriched uranium high in uranium-235. Now those are gonna be putting off a lot of neutrons, but what would you tell me about those neutrons? They're, They're too fast. So you need to slow them down. So how do you slow them down? Okay, one thing you can use is water. If you have collisions, if you have something that's the same mass as a neutron and a neutron collide, you're going to have the most slowing you can have for that neutron. So water has lots of hydrogens. You have a collision with the hydrogen. If the hydrogen doesn't absorb the neutron and become deuterium, then you've done a, a good amount of slowing down. So you could put it in water to slow them down. Now, if your water slows them down enough for a... <laughs> 
for things to go on. You might have a problem. They have moderators also that they put in. So they put in a moderator water. You might also have something like, uh, I can't remember the types of materials. I think graphite or something like that, that will help slow down the neutrons. So the neutrons slow down, reach another rod, and they cause another reaction. But of course, if you have three neutrons that come off for every reaction, and each one of those neutrons goes off to have another reaction, what do we call that? We call that an explosion. So we have to make sure that not all of the neutrons go on to cause another reaction. So we're going to have to control the neutrons, how many there are. So the last piece that we put in here, and I say we, obviously I didn't devise any of these, are control rods. Okay, didn't leave myself enough space. These control rods ideally are put in there so if all goes bad, you can hit a lever and it just drops them and drops them so they're there in between the fuel rods and they're absorbing a bunch of neutrons. So those fuel rods are there to absorb neutrons so that you keep it so on average, one neutron from a radioactive um, fission event goes on to cause another radioactive fission event. If it's anything less than one, that's for every fission, if you have 0.999 reactions, what's going to happen to the rate of reaction? It's going to die. If it's 1.0001, what happens to the rate of the reaction? It blows up. So you have to have the, they call it the multiplication factor, F, the number of neutrons that go from one fission reaction to go on to cause another fission reaction, exactly one, to keep the power plant operational. So it has to be critical. Critical means the multiplication factor is exactly one. So for every fission reaction, you produce one more fission reaction. So when you start it up, just like your car, you start it up, you pull up the control rods, and it's going to be bigger than that, it gets up to a certain temperature, you lower them to keep it at that temperature. Then when you want to shut it down, you put the control rods down lower, absorb more neutrons, and shut it down. Now, I was at least told, and I've heard something recently that seems to indicate that it was correct, that the whole Chernobyl disaster, which occurred, I believe, when I was in college, maybe in high school, I think it was college, occurred because they were testing to see how quickly they could cool the reactor down. So let's heat her up. Now it's cool. Oh, shoot, we got it too hot. They turned off their computer protection so they could you know, get it too hot and do it air. Yeah. Sorry, I uh, they they were checking to see if it would function without properly without the uh, backup. Um, so they turned off the backup, and then they removed most of their control rods for some odd reason, and turned off the computer that would put the control rods back down in there. So their minimum, I think, it was 18. They're allowed to have in there, and they have like nine. Out of like two control rods. I mean, come on. Well, they have like two hundred control rods. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it was a it was a human error situation trying to <laughs> trying to do a dangerous experiment really. Um, that's what people really worry about with nuclear power. What if you have something like that? Well, what happened with Chernobyl? <laughs> it blew its top off, right? And then you release all kinds of radioactive gases everywhere. Bad, bad times. Um, the Russian reactor design, at least back then, wasn't really worried about it blowing up. The U.S. had much safer reactor designs, at least that's what the propaganda is, so that it would be less likely to occur with one of the U.S. Re reactor designs if they did something as foolish as that. Did you have a question, John? No, okay. But that's how, that's how a reactor works. Now, there's lots of different types of reactors. You might have heard the term breeder reactor, reactor. A breeder reactor is breeding its own fuel. How do you breed it? Well, we've kind of talked about it. Most of uranium is 238. The 238 is not useful for a reactor. But if it absorbs a few neutrons, it can become plutonium-239, which is useful. So a breeder reactor is actually absorbing some of the neutrons into uranium-238 and producing more fissionable material. Yeah? Is that why they don't? Some, they sometimes like don't? Completely enrich the uranium and just put it in so that some of it's 238 and some of it's 235. Or... 
I don't know the full answer. That's certainly partial, but you have lots of different reactor designs that work with different ratios. So I, I don't know the full answer. Do we have nuclear power plants in the state of Nebraska? I think we do. Like over on the border between us and Iowa there, where do they have nuclear power plants? Where there's water, why? To cool it. It's not the water that's here. This water here stays there because that water is going to be radioactive. It's going to be heavy water. You're going to have deuterated and tritiated water. That is some of the hydrogens have absorbed one or two neutrons. So that water is not released. So you can't use it for cooling. But what they have is heat exchangers. You have pipes that bring nice river water in and you, you exchange heat. You heat up that river water and you dump it back in the river. That's why they build them near bodies of water near rivers or oceans or lakes. If you might want to make a bomb, is that easier or harder? Generally easier. The simplest way to make a nuclear bomb is you get a bunch of fuel. If you have a big enough chunk of uranium-235, because a neutron that leaves a fission reaction will bounce around and lose energy, if it's a big enough chunk, it's going to lose enough energy that eventually it's got a really good chance of being absorbed. And so big enough chunk, we say if you have a critical mass, then it will have a multiplication factor that's bigger than one naturally. And so you just get a big enough chunk of uranium-235 and boom, it blows up. Now, how do you do this without blowing up in the lab? Simple. We are not dumb people here. I could take one rock and say this is three quarters of the critical mass. And then I'm going to put some kind of barrier between it and another rock that's three quarters of the critical mass. And this barrier is going to absorb the neutrons, so we have no problems. When I want to make a bomb, what do I do? <laughs> I remove the barrier, smash them together, and it goes boom. It's not hard. Now, is that a high yield bomb? No. To get a high yield bomb, yeah, they have to do a lot of stuff to optimize. So one design might be that you take something that looks like a soccer ball with a whole bunch of subcritical pieces that are out here and separate it. And then you make a detonation that's going to push all those pieces to the center and give you a supercritical mass that's a much bigger mass, much bigger, you know. So there's a lot of work that goes into increasing the yields. But just making a bomb, simple. What's a dirty bomb? Yeah, it's not a nuclear bomb per se. It's not a fission bomb. What it is, is it just has radioactive materials that are going to be dispersed. So like I was talking to my family, I think I told you I have one friend who was pretty sure that this week we're going to have nuclear war with you know, North Korea. I, I don't think that that's reasonably likely. But um, North Korea, just after all the saber rattling started, they did a test launch that failed. Now, if you do a launch of a, an ICBM aimed at the United States with a nuclear warhead and it blows up on your launch pad, you didn't have a fission bomb, you don't have that big boom, but you have all of that nice radioactive material that you have spread out over your countryside. And because the place where they do this is close to China, you've also spread it to China, to China, where China say, hey, hey, you better not. Because um, if you know they, they don't have reliable delivery and if it blows up, it's still gonna be a dirty bomb, even if it's not a fission bomb. And so, you know, it would be probably 50% chance if they tried to bomb us with the you know, ICBM with a nuclear warhead, 50% chance they damage themselves instead. 50% chance we die. Um, not a fan, actually, of either one of those. Let me say something really clear. I don't know if you guys read, but Aaron Hernandez, the former tight end for the New England Patriots, hung himself in his jail cell this morning. And I read that, and it really disturbed me. Now, he's not a good man, right? He, by all appearances, was guilty of the murders he was acquitted of last week and guilty of the murder that he's in jail for. It still makes me sad to have people die, no matter what their situation. And so bombs disturb me. I've been talking about them here. If you go back to World War II, 
the U.S. built these atomic bombs. And we had all of the great scientists working on it. I talked a little bit about it. They realized that you could make a bomb by having these mass defect, you know, having the fission reactions and Russia or Russia, Germany stopped talking about it. So they wrote a letter to the president, had Albert Einstein sign it saying, you know, they could be making a bomb that would shift the balance of power all the way to them. We would be destroyed. We have to do something. And so the president authorized them to work on this. They started up there at University of Chicago. They quickly realized if we have an accident, Chicago is probably not the best place to have an accident. Let's move somewhere no one wants to be. So they moved to New Mexico. And, okay, that was probably a little harsh. <laughs> Let's just say a place where no one is, okay? That's less harsh. So they, they moved to New Mexico and they continued their research and they built a, a nuclear fission bomb. And they actually built two different types, one using uranium as the fuel, one using plutonium as the fuel. And then they were used. They dropped, I think it was the uranium one on Hiroshima, and then a few days later, the plutonium one on Nagasaki. And, you know, that ended the war. We had been carpet bombing Japan, killing hundreds of thousands of people, okay? It was very brutal. And this ended it, and that's good. But it also killed about 100,000 people in one day and another 100,000 people over their extensions of their lives because of the damage they received from radiation. That's bad. And so the scientists who had worked on this, they worked on it because they were very single-minded. They were like, if we don't do this, then life as we know it is going to end. So we have to do this. We have to use our knowledge to protect the life as we know it. Then after the bombs were dropped, many, many of them had a change of heart. And they said, we've done something very evil. We've used our scientific knowledge to do something bad. And so many of them want to be completely away from that. So you had the person who was in charge of the process. Um, for goodness sakes, I can't remember his name suddenly. Um, he ran the process. The guy would be considered a commie pinko by their standards of the day. But he was working on making this bomb. And so it was okay. But then after this bomb, other scientists said, you know, there's a lot more energy available if you do fi uh, fusion instead of fission. This graph shows the binding energy per nucleon. So basically that's how much energy is lost per nucleon for different elements. And you can see that iron and zinc have the most energy loss. That is, you've converted the most mass into energy. It's the, most, it's the strongest bond. And so if you move toward iron, you can, you're going to release energy. So going from uranium toward iron releases energy. Going from helium towards iron releases energy. Well, if you look there, the biggest difference you can get that's simple is going from hydrogen. Now that shows H2, it doesn't show H1. Why? H1's not bonded to anything. It's zero on that graph because it doesn't have any binding energy. So if you go from hydrogen to helium, that's a huge amount of energy per nucleon. You can get a much bigger yield per mass of your starting bomb. And so they came to the um, person who came to the station, and they said, hey, we need you to help us build a fusion bomb. And he said, no, no. <laughs> I made a bomb. It was evil, bad. I'm done. And then they said, oh, well, you're a communist, you know. And after that, he was ostracized because of his communistic leanings. As long as he was making war things, it was okay. <laughs> Now, I talk all about all of this. Obviously, I stopped the, the lecture proper to talk about some important ramifications of science. Many of us are going into science in one way or another. And, you know, if you're going into medicine, you have the, the not hypocritical, the Hi Hippocratic oath about, I will do no harm. Scientists have crossed the line numerous times. And we always need to keep in mind that we have a responsibility, that we can't just learn science and we are void of any responsibility about what's done with the knowledge that we develop. Now it is time for you to do the teacher evaluations. And so Isaac will take over from here. If you go to Moodle, you'll have direct links for the, uh,